Today, I have a few puzzles for you. Uh, the first is this. What's the sum of the numbers from 1 to 10? So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10. Uh, go ahead and pause the video, come up with an answer, and then come on back. Okay, you should have gotten 55 for that. Uh, 1 plus 2 is 3, 3 plus 3 is 6, plus 4 is 10, plus 5 more is 15, plus 6 is 21, plus 7 is 28, plus 8 is 36, plus 9, it's 4, 5, 45, plus the final 10 gives 55. So now there's another puzzle for you. What is the sum of the numbers from 1 to 100? And I'll give you a hint. It's probably not gonna be most efficient to add the numbers just like I did up to 55. That's gonna take a long time and I really don't wanna torture you by having you add up all those numbers. So see if you can think of a clever way that you can find that sum without adding um, 100 consecutive numbers together. If you want to pause the video and work on that, do so and then come on back. So how did you do? Did you come up with a clever way to uh, add up those numbers from one to 100? Well, this problem actually is one that was given several hundred years ago to a young man who's about 11 years old. His name was Friedrich Gauss. He was a German student, and the legend says that he was being like bad in class or the class was being punished, and the teacher wanted to keep the kids really occupied for a while. And so she gave them this question, add up the numbers from one to 100. Now, thinking that would take him a long time to, to do this. Well, after just a couple of minutes, he came up and had the answer, and it was correct. And so from that point on, his parents recognized that, you know, this kid is, is pretty special. They sent him to a, a special school for mathematics, and he actually became one of the most famous mathematicians of all time. Let's talk about how Gauss might have figured this out, and let's go back to our original question where we just added the numbers one through 10. So let's go ahead and look at a material that can help to see physically what Gauss might have been thinking. So what we see here in this material are the numbers from one to 10. For example, this rod down here is split up into 10 sections, uh, five are red, five are blue. So this represents the number 10, and up here we have the number one, and then all the numbers in between. We can think about this as a question of what's the area? Because I really want to know how many rectangles there are here. I want to know how much stuff there is inside this object. It kind of looks like a right triangle anyway. Um, but we want to find the area of this. And the easiest way for us to find area is to make this into a rectangle. So if we could rearrange this into a rectangle, then we could just multiply the uh, base times the height, and then we'll have the area, which will represent the sum of the numbers from one to 10, because that's what we see here. So here's what we can do. We can take this uh, one from the top and add it over here to this end. Do the same thing for the two. Three. Four and the five. So let's see what we have here. We have a 10 and one. We added the rod of one to the rod of 10 to give us 11. And these are all gonna be 11. So here we have nine and two, eight and three, seven and four and six and five. But the point is, is that we have 11 across the bottom. So the base of our rectangle is 11. And then our height is going to be five. We can just see there's one, two, three, four, five. So 11 times five is 55. And that's a really nice way of, of calculating that very quickly. Now, the question that we have is, you know, what if I wanted to do one to 100 or one to 350 and I wanted to do different numbers? Uh, I'm not gonna have the materials uh, to do that with, but the method should be the same. I mean, after all, if I just had the numbers from one to eight, instead of from one to 10, I could do the same thing. And we could imagine making this all the way down to 100 and doing the same thing. What would we be doing if we had this from one to 100? Well, we would take this one and we would line it up way down at the bottom with the rod of 100. So that means our base would be 101. And would it work for everything else? Well, sure, we have one plus 100. Then we'd have the two going with the 99, which is 101. And then uh, three with the 98, which is 101. And so what we would have is we would have 101 across the bottom. So we're gonna have to pretend that this is the whole 101 here. So if we did all that, it would take a long time, but we would have 101 across the bottom. We'd have lots of rows of them. How many rows would we have? Well, 
If we have 100 rods here in a row, what are we doing every time? We're pairing them up. And when we pair things, we make them into groups of two. So instead of having 100, we would pair them until we would have 50 pairs. So instead of having five here, oh, and we have five because we took half of 10. Instead, we're gonna have 50 because that would be half of the 100. And now we can multiply 101 times 50 because we'll have 50 rows of 101. And that's something we can do um, on paper very easily. We could probably do it mentally as well. well. Let's do it mentally, that'll be fun. How much is 50 hundreds? 50 hundreds is 5,000. And how much is 50 ones? That's 50. So the answer should be 5,000 and 50. And that's the sum of the numbers from one to 100. And that's probably how Gauss did it. He imagined maybe a picture like this of, in his mind of, of a material such as this, or maybe he imagined it this way. If we write the numbers from one to 100, now we're not gonna write them all, that would take way too long. And what we did with the material was we paired the one with the 100, the first with the last one, giving us 101. And then the two would match with the 99, giving us 101. The three with the 98, the four with the 97, and so on. And of course, since we're pairing them, we're gonna have 50 pairs. We're gonna make these little rainbow arcs here. And if that's the way Gauss thought about it, that's very similar to what we did with the material. Instead of adding an order, we're adding in a way that makes sense to be able to um, use multiplication rather than addition. Let's talk about what we're doing generally now. So we can definitely do it with specific numbers and we can practice. Uh, we're adding, we're always gonna add one to the last number and then we're gonna see how many pairs we would have. So for example, if we didn't wanna add the numbers from one to 350, what would we do? We'd have one plus 350 giving, giving us 351. And then we keep doing that over and over again until we had a whole bunch of pairs. Well, if we have 350 numbers, we're gonna have half that many pairs, which would be 175. So we would multiply 175 by 351, and that would give us our final answer. So since we're doing the same thing every time, it doesn't really matter what the numbers are. We're always starting with one, and we're ending with some giant number. So these number rods represent the numbers from one to 10. We actually pretended they represented the numbers from one to 100 before, but really these can represent any number at all. And so we're gonna use the letter N to stand for any number that we want it to be. It could be 100, 350, 75 million, 364,220, any number that we want. So this last rod down here is gonna be the N, that's gonna be our nth number. And then we're gonna have how many numbers of those? We're gonna have N of those. So right now, the last rod is 10, and there are 10 rows. If this was 100, the last rod would be a rod of 100, and there would be 100 rows. And so, it doesn't matter what number that is, we're gonna have N rows, and this last rod will be N. So what are we always doing next? We're taking the one, and we're adding it on to the end here. So that means this bottom base is always gonna be one more than whatever our last number is. So rather than having n, now our length is gonna be n plus one. And we see here, this is no longer n. It's one short of n, now it's two short, three, and so on. But again, it doesn't matter what number that is, compared to the original number, how much is the new number going to be here? It's gonna be half as big, because I'm doing them in pairs. So this is now going to be half of n. Now we can find the area. So the area of our rectangle, which we're using a for, but it can also stand for the amount that we're trying to find as well. The area is gonna be one half n times n plus one, or base times height. Uh, when I have this n plus one here, since it's one length, I do wanna put it in parentheses so that we remember that it's a group. And actually, since I've done that, I don't need the multiplication sign. We can just say this is one half n times n plus one. So we can verify this formula by redoing the ones we already know. So we first had that n was 10, we added the numbers from one to 10. So that's one half times 10 times 10 plus one, which is one half of 10 times 11, which is five times 11, which is 55. So that works. What about when n was 100? 
Well, that's one half times 100 times 101. I'm gonna do the one half times 100 first, that's 50. And 50 times 101 is 5,050. Now, of course the formula is going to work because when I was doing the work by hand, when I put the numbers in and did, and did the uh, arithmetic, I was just doing the same thing that we did with the materials and that we saw, or maybe we thought about with the arcs when we thought about the numbers from one to 100 like Gauss might have done it. So uh, this is a way that we can add the numbers more quickly, but it's not a formula we really have to memorize. We can just rethink of that original question and then think about um, how we would add those numbers up. Well, we're gonna take whatever our last row is and add one to it, and then we're gonna have half as many rows as we started with. And that's all this formula says. Now, if you've already done work with area formulas, you might have seen something like this before where we can represent a formula in different ways geometrically. Right now we're taking half of n, but there's another way to think about this, and I'd like to show that to you right now. So this is a second way to add up the numbers from one to 100. Uh, here we have the number rods again. Uh, this time I lined them up on the left. That's probably the way that you are used to seeing them. It doesn't matter if we line them up on the left or the right. It's all gonna be the same anyway. Previously what we did was we took the rows from the top and moved them down here to the bottom. In other words, we did it just with this one set. But like we've seen with all of our area formulas, we could do it with two copies. So let's get a copy of this and see what happens. So here's my numbers from one to 10. Here's my numbers from one to 10 again. And if I take this and I slide it down here, what do we have? Well, we have, again, a row of 11 across the bottom. We have 10 rows because we didn't make pairs, so we actually have 10 rows. And so what's the total going to be of this rectangle? It's going to be 110. But we only want half of that. 110 is the whole thing, but we just want half. And so if we take half of 110, that's going to give us our 55. So rather than making pairs right away, we can take a, a duplicate of it and then take half when we're done. Now we can do the same technique with, with any number. So let's go ahead and do it again, but instead of using 10, let's use n for any number. So we have n rows and the bottom number is going to be n. When we put these together, our bottom row now becomes n plus one. To find the total area, we would multiply n times n plus one. That's our total area of our rectangle. And then to find the part that we want, we just divide the entire thing by two. So we can also think of the formula as n times n plus one, all divided by two. Again, it doesn't matter if we put the half in the front, then that's the interpretation where we used one set and made pairs. If we do the divided by two, then we have two sets and we make a rectangle and then we just take half when we're all done. We could also do this interpretation as well in the writing. If you wanna try that on your own, adding up the numbers from one to 100, uh, before we made pairs with the arcs to show um, how we paired these together, think about what you would do to show this listing out the numbers from one to 100. And that could be another way to think about the formula. At any rate, um, it's a very clever way to add the sum of counting numbers. And the truth is, we have to add counting numbers uh, more often than not in a lot of different applications. We can also expand this to what happens when we don't start with one. What if we wanna add the numbers from 55 to 1,000? Or we wanna add every even number from 100 to 200? So there's all kinds of variations that you can go ahead and explore and try, along with really understanding and using this formula here that is attributed to Gauss from when he was actually a child. So I hope you enjoyed the lesson and thank you very much. So as you've seen in this lesson, we went from some numerical examples to the formula rather quickly. Of course, we could spend a lot of time uh, with the students doing numerical examples, having them arrive at the formula more themselves, and then we could use the material to demonstrate uh, the formula that they've, already, um, that they've already arrived at, just maybe not with the formalization. The more traditional way to line up the number rods is the second way that I did it, where they are justified on the left-hand side. I just did it on the right-hand side kind of by accident during the lesson because it's just how I put them there. It doesn't matter at all for the students uh, which way that we do it, but if we want to connect it more to work students have done um, earlier on, then putting on the left is just the more common way uh, to do the work. 
In this lesson, I showed both ways, both derivations of the formula. Uh, we don't have to do both ways. We could do one way and then leave the other way to the students to discover on their own. We could do it at separate times. I think it really depends on uh, how much work students have had with area. If they've done the area work before, then it makes sense and they can really uh, understand the connections between those. If not, then it may be a lot to do at one time. So as with any lesson, we're free to break it up into smaller chunks or to eliminate some parts and, and do them later or leave them as explorations.